And we're live, rationalvc.com. Iman, you're looking like a Persian rug bazaar salesman with, uh, with the new digs and whatever you've done to it. Hopefully I got shit you're... to sell. I got stuff to sell, bro. <laughs> Today is someone who we've got hold of who, as I joked before we got on, is uh, right now more, more popular than Barack Obama when he was campaigning. Guest today is Mac Conwell. Mac is uh, probably if you're in the venture space and the startup space, if you're on tech Twitter, you would have heard of him. If you haven't, then you can find him at Mac Conwell, which we'll link in the description. He is actually known as Mac the VC. And Mac story, Mac actually followed me in 2020 on Twitter. And I was like, well, okay, who's, who's this? Uh, very interesting profile, hacker turned hustler. And I just saw he was very active on Twitter. So kept a close eye. And shortly thereafter, you know, I blinked, opened my eyes, and uh, he had raised the fund. Meteoric rise. And we managed to get hold of him. As I said, he's, he's been on a tremendous rise. You could call it a roadshow. He's do, done the rounds on the pods and whatever. But what impressed me most was his 1,100 Zoom meetings in the space of three months to raise this fund. And, uh, you know, I thought when I was 18 to 20 doing 40 hours uh, in a, on the phones, brokering, uh, working while being in college full time, I thought that was hustle, but this took it to another level. And uh, I just want to get into it, man. Mac, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm glad we could make it happen. I know it took a little while to get here, but we're here now. And uh, yeah, hustle. Uh, uh, I'm all about the hustle. <clears throat> and and uh, anyone watching on YouTube with the uh, art piece behind him, which I joked before we got on, I said it reminds me of Meek Mill with the with the dirt bikes, but he said, no, Baltimore represents. So they are the yes. real pioneers. So uh, we've, got, we've got to let them know. <laughs> yes, the 12 o'clock boys behind me. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's an amazing piece from a local artist by the name of Chris Wilson. So um, check him out. He does some great stuff. Uh, but yeah, so well, let's get into it. Love it, man. Mac, wh where I want to start is, so by background, I don't want to make this about me, but I am an Iranian immigrant. I came to the UK at the age of five. I come from a low socioeconomic background, went to what was rated as one of the worst schools in England. They closed down the... 12th to 13th grade, which is like the pre-college, we call it sixth form here. They closed that down shortly after I left. And uh, basically I went through it. As I said, I, I was working like a full-time job while in college and undergrad and uh, just doing a lot of stuff. And all of this, you know, led, led to Iman and I launching Minority in Tech when we started Rational VC, which is to help a lot of the minorities in London and in UK who are trying to break into tech and VC. One thing I notice among the minorities is the, uh, you could call it, a, you know, our friend, Dr. Cameron Sepper quoted Josh Wolf, uh, the venture capitalist. He says, chips on shoulders puts chips in pockets, uh, which Cam, Cam Sepper, our friend says, it's not healthy, but it is what it is. It's, it's what makes this space go around. Much of this space is about tenacity, drive, patience, and I'm really fascinated by what has to go through one's head and the psychology and internal self-talk when going from, in your case, homelessness to where you are now. Can you walk me through that? Look, when you come from difficult backgrounds, right, when you come from low social economic backgrounds and, you know, you've didn't know half of what the world had to offer, right? Like it just, it wasn't apparent to you. And you've gone through like real hard situations. Like you, you hear people talk about having hard lives, struggling, having a hard job. And like, those things are real, right? No, I don't want to discredit that. But like, you know, when you've been living in a truck for months, <laughs> right? You know, uh, telling your friends, hey, you know, I just got finished playing the basketball game. I'm on my way to a date. You mind if I stop by and take a shower at your house? It's because you don't have anywhere to take a shower, right? And you know what it feels like to be really low. And then to go from that to having a six-figure job in the span of like less than a year, 
or I guess about a year and a half, it makes you realize like, yeah, I've been really low before. I'll probably never be that low again. And if I ever was, I know how to get back here, right? So it gives you the ability or the mindset to take serious risk. Because like, what's the worst thing that I could ever happen, right? The worst thing that happens, I lose everything. Okay. If I lost everything, I still have my mind. I still have an amazing skill set. I still know how to make money. So if I ever needed to make money again, I could like, like if everything around me failed tomorrow and I, and I, I sucked at being a VC, all my investments failed. I lost money for everybody. I become a pariah in this industry. I still know how to code. Like if I wanted to, I could make websites and just do just fine. Like I could, I could go to local small businesses, make some e-commerce websites and still make myself six figures. Right. And like, be easy about it. All right. Like, like I don't even have to deal with like WordPress anymore. I could get a web flow and make my life even easier. Right. Or go back to, you know, doing Shopify websites and keep it moving. Right. So like, you know, it's, it's not so much a chip as it is just the realization that like, yeah, life can get hard and things can, can get tough. But that's just kind of par for the course. And if you break through it, you know, you, you, you can get to the other side. And that's the, I think that's the part that people miss is like in the word breakthrough, the beginning of the word is break, right? Yeah. You got to go to the break to get to the through. And the break is the part that sucks, right? Nobody wants to go through that part, right? Like everybody sees, you know, LeBron James is like, oh, that's amazing. It's like, you don't see him spending, you know, eight hours a day doing a bunch of stuff that sucks. <laughs> like who wants to get a first thing in the morning, drink something terrible, go do some wind sprints, put up a bunch of shots, go to the weight room. Like nobody wants to do that. And then you have to do that every day, like for years. Like he's been doing that every day since he was like 15. Man's 37, right? Like, like who wants to spend 22 years of every morning just like, ugh. It's, it's, you know, like, like, you know, I'm 35 now. I wake up and my knees be creaking. You know, my back just rarely hurts. <laughs> like, just getting out of bed, my body hurts. And just imagine, like, it's you got to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go do a whole bunch of stuff nobody wants to do. Just for that moment of that, you know, that full 48 minutes where everybody's cheering and thinks you're amazing. Right? So, you know, it's just having that mindset. Mac, tell me about the weekend when you, when you quit your job. And the events that led to it. Cause I feel like this mindset, and by the way, the mindset you talk about that LeBron has, that's a mindset either that comes through hardship or you're born with it, right? Um, it's nature or nurture. It can be both, but it seems with you, it's, <laughs> it's very much a combination of the two. So tell me about that weekend, you quit your job and what led to it. And then what happened afterwards? So I will say this, keep in mind, I am the dude who likes to quit things. Right? <laughs> Cause if I don't like it and I think there's something better, I will quit. So case in point, when I was a junior in college, my, my third year in university, um, I looked around and told all my friends, yeah, I think I'm going to drop out of school. I think I'm going to get a job. And all my friends thought I was going to be a loser. Two years later, I got a six-figure job. <laughs> um, so I have no problem quitting a job because like, I, go get, I go get one. But what happened was I was working at a marketing firm in Baltimore. This is after I had two startups, you know. One went well, one didn't. And so I just wanted to stay at a steady paycheck. And I had this job, you know, working with the technical team at this marketing firm. And it wasn't a great job, but it paid pretty well. And it was in a great location in Baltimore. Like I walk out of my job and I was in the heart of the city, right by the harbor where all the happenings is going on. Right. So like, you know, in a city where there's a lot of, there's not a whole lot of parking. I had a parking lot I could go to any given day and go to any party, any bar, anything I wanted to do. Right. This is a great location, but um, they ended up getting a client I didn't agree with ethically. Um, it was a client that had historically not supported um, black individuals. And so when we won that contract, that was on a Friday, I quit. And I've been telling people for like two weeks, no, if we win this contract, I'm gonna quit, right? Everybody thought I was joking. All my friends were telling me, you know, don't quit. Make sure you slide up another job first, all that. Don't just like, nah, 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 if this happens, I'll quit. And all, if I'm going to be very honest, I never thought we were going to win that contract. Like, I really, like, I didn't think we would win it, but we did. And so I quit. And I quit on principle. I had no clue what I was going to do. I didn't have, like, I had been the founder of two startups. I'm CEO of both of them. So I knew how to do that. I gained all these new skill sets. But my baseline skill set was as an engineer. 
which, you know, was probably a bad use of my overall talents at this point in life. But it's like, somehow, some way, I could cobble together a resume with these unique skills and I find a job doing something. Either being doing BD somewhere, head of growth at a startup, start my own startup, or being an engineer somewhere. It's like, I don't need this job. I'll quit. And so I gave them my two week notice. And then the very next Monday, um, the investment arm of state of Maryland put out like this community wide email blast and they were hiring a new fund manager. I was foolish enough and arrogant enough to believe that, you know, yeah, why not give that a shot? I mean, it just so happened one of my advisors, one of my mentors who I'd known since like my very first startup, uh, I worked there. So I called him. I'm like, I'm still at my old job at this point. I'm like staring at my computer and I call him. I'm like, hey, you know, I, I see this, this job open. What do you think? Because, you know, again, I don't have a college background. I don't have a college degree. I don't have a finance background, right? But I know startups really well. I have a really strong brand in the local Baltimore tech ecosystem. And he tells me, you know what, Mac? We're trying to do some things differently here. You know, might as well put your, you know, throw your hat in the ring. That's all I needed to hear. And so I proceeded to write a cover letter for the first time in my life and apply to that one job and only that one job. In my mind, if I was going to apply, I was going to get the job. As arrogant as that sounds, not understanding like how prestigious of a job it was or like what kind of talent I was going up against, never even crossed my mind. I said, yeah, yeah. I should be able to do this. Four and a half months later, uh, they take me to lunch. I'll never forget this. I had never had a job send me a, a something I'm meaning to go to lunch, right? So I'm like, this must be good, but this is different. And so they take me to lunch and um, the COO of the organization, I'll never forget this, sits down, he's like, Mac, you know, we really like you, thought you were really smart, but you don't have the experience for the job. So now I'm sitting here at this lunch table with this like really fancy food and everything being mad. Like, why did you invite me out here just to tell me no? Like you could send me an email and give me a call for that. But like, I didn't have a chance to respond because he just kept talking. He's like, but we really, really like you. And, you know, we think, you know, there's a spot for you in our team. So, you know, we want you to know we're creating this new position, the junior position. I wanted to know if you'd be willing to take it. Well, of course I'm going to take it. Hell yeah, I'm going to take it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy and then he tells me how much they're going to offer me in salary, which was not a negotiation. It was the least amount of money I'd have ever made in my professional <laughs> career. And I happily took that money and ran with it. Right. And so I literally broke in the venture off of an email. Fuck, you know. <laughs> I always talk about the power of cold outreach. It's literally how I've done a lot of stuff. We've done a lot of stuff, but. There you go. 100% hit rate. One out of one from Matt Conwell over that weekend. It ain't that easy, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's not that easy in real life. It's not that easy for sure. But uh, so shifting gears, Mac, you are what we and some consider to be the goat of the tech Twitter game. You essentially 10x your following uh, since 2020. Uh, or in 2020, and it's gone on an even more of a rise since then. So just over 60K followers now. How did you do it? Because to outsiders, it's like they're thinking Twitter, social media, why the hell would I use social media? It's a waste of time. Uh, even I have a love-hate relationship with it. You know, I'm like, ah, dopamine kicks and validation. And But then I get on it and I got, got, got all these hot contacts in my DMs that we're networking and Walk me through what, what's your best advice for how to develop brand and distribution as a defensible moat? I didn't do Twitter to build a brand. I, I didn't even do Twitter to, to grow my network originally. I was just tweeting to educate folks on how venture works, right? Like when I was an entrepreneur, one of the things I wanted to do was understand how VCs thought. Because I figured if I understood how they thought, I'd be able to pitch better. And that give me a better chance to raise funding. And so being on the other side, I just continuously came to this realization that most founders have no clue how venture capital works and how VCs make their decisions. And so really my Twitter thing was, so it started off, so this is June of 2020. This is after George, the killing of George Floyd. So there were just things I wanted to get off my head, some things I just, I just need, I needed an outlet. And after I did that, I just ran an experiment. I was like, yeah, what's, let's see what, what happens if I just tweet every day for two weeks? Like, I had never been that active on Twitter. And mostly because, like, whenever I would tweet, 
I would get a bunch of founders reaching out to me and I'd be like, oh, okay, it's too much. <laughs> let me let me go back to my day job. And also at the time I worked for the investment arm of the state of Maryland. So I could only invest in companies in the state of Maryland, right? So getting companies from all over the country and all over the globe reaching out to me wasn't like helping. I was like, all right, you know, I'm gonna just keep tweeting and see what happens. And I just did what I normally do. I just tweet about venture, how venture works, giving founders tips, you know, how to think about pitching, how to think about traction, just, just trying to democratize information about, you know, venture. And through the course of that, I met um, Roberto, the founder of uh, RoboAmp out of Dallas, Texas, who was a Latin gentleman building a really cool company in Dallas and couldn't get any funding because he was a Latin guy in Dallas. So I'm like, okay, let me try to help him. So I tried to put together, the, I tried to get some advisors of mine together to make an investment in his company through a special purpose vehicle, SPV. And then one of my advisors was like, yeah, I like this company, but I don't want to invest in this company. I want to invest in every company that you find, Mac. So here's 250, go raise a fund. It's like, okay, so, so what do I do now? I very quickly saw that my personal network got me to about 400K and had no clue how to raise a fund. But then like, as I'm doing this tweeting thing, I'm noticing a lot more VCs are following me, which I, I, I never considered, right? I, I never thought that would happen. So I'm like, okay. So as I tweet, VCs and founders are following me. Well, now I want to raise this fund and I've been pushed to do it, but I need help. I got to learn how to do it. And so I just said, yo, I, I need to talk to as many VCs as I can so I can learn. And so I just started seeing like, hey, if you're a VC and you follow me, let me, let me, see you, let me send you a DM and see if you'll take time with me. And most VCs would, because in this industry, it's a network-based industry, and most VCs or most investors will take meetings with another investor because we're all looking for deal flow. We all want to know like what kind of companies we're seeing. We want to see if you can send us companies. And so I was able to get on a bunch of people's calendars, and as I'm going, I'm, I'm learning, I'm picking up tips. And then one of the first, I guess, 25 meetings I had was with Elizabeth Yen from Hustle Fund. Now, mind you, Elizabeth is all, was already a force on Twitter, hustle, the hustle fund one was already, you know, knee deep in and like they had a brand and all that. I didn't know any of that. Right. She was just a, a, a VC I reached out to and, you know, I'm, I'm telling her my story. I'm telling her thing about raising the fund. I'm telling her I'm trying to figure out how to raise. She asked me about my minimum. And in our first meeting, 30 minute meeting, she commits 10 K to my fund. And that was a light bulb moment. It's like, Oh, the more means I have like this, the more chances I have of raising money. And so then that just became the strategy. I'm going to keep tweeting, not to build the brand, but just tweeting to share information with folks, which is what I already do. And as I do that, more VCs are going to follow me. And so I'm going to just set up more meetings. And hopefully as I have these meetings, some percentage of them are going to want to commit money to my fund. And one thing I should say in that, and I don't think I, I've mentioned this on many other podcasts, is that I never went into those meetings looking for money. So mm -hmm. when I said I had those 1,100 meetings, none of those meetings came for the idea of me looking for money. It was all relationship building, relationship building and learning. But I knew that within that, as I told my story, some percentage of folks would get interested enough where we could have a money conversation without me having to bring it up. And so... Was that the smartest way to go about it? Maybe not. Should I have been more intentional asking for money and I, had, and I could have had less meetings? Maybe, right? But that was just a strategy that popped up in my head. And then it wasn't until after that where the tweeting thing is working and I'm meeting these folks and like now it's building, building, building. Then I took a step back to think through like, okay, how to use Twitter as brand building. But like the brand had been built before I ever considered it. Mac, who, who are the overlooked and underserved that you speak about that Rare, Rare Breed Ventures looks to support? Because you just spoke really clearly just there about how your personal brand and what you personally believe in and how you interact with people allows you to think about outreach or reaching out to raise a fund or whatever it is in a completely authentic and um, not money-driven way, which like you say, could have positives, could have negatives when you're raising a fund. But what that does for you in particular and the brand that you emanate is it makes you find the niches and the types of founders that a lot of other uh, VCs are missing. So who are these overlooked and underserved? They're folks like me, right? Like when I started my first company in 2010, 
I didn't know what a starter was. I didn't know what a VC was. I didn't even know what networking was. Right? Like, like I, I didn't know any of this stuff. And you're like a founder, like bumping into things in the dark until like you trip over the right thing and somehow a light switch comes on. You're like, oh, this is everything, right? And so that could be anybody, right? Like when we talk about overlooked or underestimated founders, we're generally talking about typically minority founders, right? But it's not always the case, right? We're investors in a company called Beauty By Me, Beauty By Me, IO, ran by a young white gentleman in Memphis, Tennessee, who changes his nail polish three times, three times a day and plays basketball every day after work, right? Charles is one of the most amazing people I know. But he's building a company out of Memphis, Tennessee that's a physical product, learning about venture as he goes, right? Like, that's the hotbed of, of venture activity, right, in Memphis. Um, but on the same side, you know, we got companies like Rebundle with, you know, amazing founder Sierra who say, hey, I don't want to have plastic synthetic hair in my head because it's toxic. And so I'm going to make synthetic hair out of plant fibers. That's not only healthy, but also sustainable as I want to have a more sustainable lifestyle. Because, you know, hair made out of plants is where, you know, VCs are dumping their money into it. <laughs> Right. Like, you know, these founders can be anybody from anywhere or like Adam, the founder of Buffalo Market, an amazing platform that helps brands get better quality delivery services to deliver to some of the top shops all across the country. You know, he's a Polish immigrant. Right. Who remembers his grandmother having a farm and having fresh food and not being able to get quality fresh food where he was. And like all these amazing people from all these amazing backgrounds who have these incredible talents, but for whatever reason, whether it's where they were born, their sexual orientation, what they look like, whatever, people discredit them. I'm here to support that. But I also say at the same breath, I'm also a capitalist, right? And so, like, you know, you look at a company like Main Street with a CEO like Doug. Doug's a repeat founder. You know, he sold his second company to Google. <laughs> like, 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 he starts Main Street with a couple of his Google, you know, coworkers. That's Sil Silicon Valley, as Silicon Valley can get. But you know what? They're one of the fastest growing companies I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And so my job is to return capital for my limited partners, the people who make investments into my fund. And so it would be behoove me <laughs> to make an investment in a company like that, right? And so, yeah, we, I talk about overlooked a lot, but my ethos is I just want to invest in the best founders. And so when people ask me what makes me different, I like to say I invest in everybody. <laughs> you know, not just underrepresented, not just the white guys in Silicon Valley, not the Pakistani Emirates. Like, I invest in any and everybody because I'm just looking for the best companies. And I truly mean that. And if you look at my portfolio, I say, you know, take my portfolio and, and put that up against some others. And, you know, we'll see some differences. <laughs> Mac, we preach that traditional diligence doesn't really apply at, let's say, pre-seed, right? Because you're looking for the type of personalities who will do well as founders. And feel free to correct me. But how do you determine who will be a winner beyond, let's say, I, I'm assuming you look for people who have chips on their shoulders. That's what we look for when we do micro angel checks. Beyond that, what, are, what, what do you look for? There, there's no traditional diligence. It's more a game of psychology and assessing human behavior for us and a bunch of other things. But what is it for you? I mean, every deal is different. Every founder is different. And so every, every, every situation is different where, you know, you got to start with a large market, right? Like, at minimum, you have to be in a, a market that's large enough to support a unicorn company. Right? Every company we invest in has to have the potential to become a unicorn. Once we get past that, it could be all kinds of things. It could be your ability to, to gain traction and execute, your ability to find customers. It could be, you know, your ability to fight through adversity, your ability to think through critically about why you had to pivot your company and go in a different direction. You know, your ability to learn from a previous failed company, your ability to say, 
I don't give a damn about you, Mac, or any other investor because I'm going to make this happen. So are you on this team or not? Right? Um, it's different for every founder. And, and some of it's, like, we talk about pattern matching, right? Every investor does pattern matching. I know it's like a dirty word. But pattern matching is really you're matching for a type of founder or a type of mindset, not a physical appearance, right? And so my, one of my favorite examples of pattern matching, um, so one of the companies we're investing in is a company called Matrix. Uh, the, founder go, the founder's name is Justin. He goes by Jay-Z. Uh, I, and, you know, he's a Gen Z founder. So like, I am of an age where I do not feel comfortable calling this young man Jay-Z. <laughs> it just doesn't work for me. Right? I know those are his initials. Right? Those are literally his initials. That's what his friends call him. To me, he's just. He's got a lot to live up to if that's his name. <laughs> yeah. And so he's got this really cool company. You got to think like Robin Hood for esports. You get to buy into your favorite esports teams using crypto. And like my first meeting with him, he's like on one of those workout balls that he uses for a chair. And so he's like bouncing up and down this entire meeting while he's got like a Pikachu doll in the background, right? And he's like talking circles around me and my partner on crypto and gaming and like super freaking intelligent because of course he's 18. And he's talking about how he's been in this industry for a while. And I'm thinking of this for a while, but then you realize like, oh yeah, he's been doing gaming and crypto since he was like 12. And Before he started this company, he got personally recruited by Sam Altman to work on a stealth stealth startup that he then spun out of to do this. And as I'm hearing him talk and as I'm hearing him like just so smart at such a young age, and he's a young Asian kid in, in, in San Francisco, now in L.A., he reminded me of the founder of a company called Path, which is a company I invested in back when I was in the state of Maryland and later invested in out of rare breed, who was a 16 year old black kid from Baltimore who called himself a growth hacker, who was talking circles around me around how to grow customer acquisition and community, right? Who now has a company that's about to raise some significant money and is a DeFi product. And, you know, his goal is to like take down Discover card. Like he wants to be bigger than Discover, right? Um, creating the largest neo bank for Gen Z consumers. And so as I'm seeing Jay-Z, this young Asian kid in San Francisco, and I'm talking to him, he reminded me so much of Femi, this black kid from Baltimore. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, that's the type of founder I'm investing in. It's like, it's, and some of that just comes with time, right? Some of this industry just comes with having seen so many companies, having seen so many founders, that when you, sometimes when you see it, you get this feeling. And a lot of what due diligence is, is confirming that feeling, right? Like, that's really what due diligence is. It's, it's like, how do you feel about this person, this company, one way or another? And now the due diligence is just give us back up and say, oh, yeah, that feeling is correct or not. Right? Matt, can you, can you learn that skill? Or do you think some of that is innate? I think you can learn it. I think it comes with time, right? Because, like, Femi was the first founder I ever invested in who then raised money from, like, top-tier angels. And then went through YC. And like, I saw it when I met him, but then he confirmed it, right? And so now if I see another young founder who reminds me of him, it's like, oh yeah, that's, I, I, I've seen this playbook before, right? But that, but that comes with experience, right? That also comes with mistakes, right? Because we've, we've all made investments that go straight to zero, sometimes faster than others, right? And, and you learn from those too, because when you go back and review those, there were red flags that came up. And so when you see the next time you meet a founder, you're like, okay, is that, is that a red flag? This feels like the red flag I saw last time. Let me ask some more questions to go deeper, right? So I think some of that can be learned. And I think some of it's just also like, some of it may be innate, like it's just the way we evaluate people and the way we evaluate markets or the way we evaluate, like really what we do as investors is we're evaluating the future, right? We're trying to see if you... Make, if you're making your company today, how big could this potentially be? And could you get there? But you got to remember, when Uber was going around, I think it was like raising their Series C, it seemed like their B or their C, they undervalued their market. Because even they, couldn't, they weren't conceiving that they could grow the market. 
they were just looking at the taxi market as, 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 as what it was and like not conceive, oh, we're creating a new, larger market, right? So some of what we do is like, could a founder do that? Because that's how you get the real big home runs. And so some of that, I think some of that just comes with time and you can learn that. And some of it's also innate, right? Like, you know, our intuitions tell us things and people always say, don't follow your intuitions when you're investing. Eh, you got to do a little bit of both. From my perspective, a little bit of data, a little bit of intuition, you get to where you need to be. Other people, all data. Other folks, all intuition. I, like, mm. I, think, there's a, I think there's a nice spot in the middle. I suspect a lot of your background has supported you in getting that innate bit right. And you've married it up with a really good learning experience. So you're coming out on top on that front. Um, let, let, me, let me switch gears quickly, Mac. And I just want to talk about the VC market in general and, and, and sort of compare that to where you are, right? So everyone talks about VC being super open, super forward thinking. Like you say, it's about betting on the future. But funding still goes to the same people, right? In, in the majority of cases, Andreessen and Sequoia still tend to fund the same types of founders. And <laughs> Stanford, Stanford White. <laughs> <laughs> Same types of founders, right? And then you also get the same MBAs or you know people with minimal skin in the game becoming VCs themselves. Kind of the reason why we did all the minority and tech stuff that Cyrus was talking about at the beginning. Why, in your opinion, does this happen both on the founder side and the VC side? And what do you propose as a potential solution? It happens because confirmation bias right? Like, if you look at Silicon Valley, right, a lot of what happened came from during times of war. Stanford and Berkeley and schools in that area were getting a lot of governmental money to fund technologies. Those technologies then spun out into companies. And when those companies did well, the founders and employers of those companies who went to those schools gave back to those schools and went back to those schools to find more talent, right? This is like, I went to Morgan State University. At some point, I'm going to give a bunch of money to Morgan State University. I'm probably going to hire people from Morgan State University. And like, that creates an economy in itself. And so it's just one of these things where like, oh, I went there, or I work with people who went there. They're all skilled. Let me find more skilled people who probably go there now, right? Oh, I see somebody who came from that school he looks like re me. He reminds me of me. We had similar upbringings. I was successful. Let me help him be successful. Right? It just becomes this thing. And so now we have these institutions that are well known for doing these things where it's like, well, if you want to find a great startup, you go to Stanford, you go to Harvard. You want to find a great VC, you go to Stanford or you go to Harvard. Why are there a bunch of great VCs who went to those schools? Because a lot of them were entrepreneurs who did really well, started their funds, and went back and hire people from their schools, right? And so it becomes this thing now in everybody's brain is well known that like, if you want to find somebody who's got the skill sets and the smarts to be a VC right out of business school, you go to Stanford, you go to Harvard, you go to Wharton, right? And so when you're sitting there, like in my position, in my fund, and let's say we put out an open call for applications because we want to look at everybody. But when I get those applications, I'm going to see Stanford, Harvard, and Wharton in that pool. I'm going to see a bunch of them. And it becomes really hard not to become enamored with that. It becomes real easy to be like, oh, you're a Stanford MBA and you're at the top of your class? Oh, you also used to do investment banking? And you worked at a startup? Oh, yeah, come on in. That's a lot easier to pick than like, oh, you got uh, an MBA from Fisk University. Okay, you went to an HBCU, and before then, you were an engineer, a civil engineer working for Under Armour, and now you want to be a venture. If I'm comparing those two resumes, it's real easy for me to default to the Stanford white guy. It takes a lot more time and effort for me to look at the student from Fisk and be like, okay, tell me about your viewpoints on venture. Tell me about your, how you do deal flow. Tell me about how you evaluate companies. And that's really what matters. But sometimes we never even get that far because we automatically assume that this other person who's had more exposure has got the better talent. And a lot of it's not more talent, it's more exposure. Mm. And because you've had more exposure, you have more experience, so you look more talented. That's a fallacy. 
but it's a fallacy that's really easy for all of us to fall into. I think we need to make you a co-host uh, of the brand because <laughs> it, this is very on brand. So yeah, uh, Mac, I want to I wanna ask you something selfishly, okay. which is, so off the back of this podcast that Iman and I have been doing for about a year and a half, we write essays, we do podcasts, we just have fun basically. And we put out what we know, what we learn and we network. So our network is built up and naturally, um, you know, bit of social proof, whatever you want to call it. And we've had very low, you could call it very low seven figures of soft commits, people pushing us to do a fund. And I would have never thought in my wildest dreams that we'd be in such a position. Um, but, and I'm sure if we leverage some of those people, uh, you know, social proof, yada, yada, and do cold outreach, which is really my background. When I do cold outreach, you can ask him on, I do cold outreach. I'm sure if we leverage those names and I go ham for like two, three months and I do those 1100 calls like you, uh, I'm confident we could at least three exit and we're looking at maybe half the size of, let's say your fund. I'm assuming I could be wrong, but to your point now, exactly what you said, like this stereotype of, oh, your background is banking and finance and corporate and all of these people, which is they just, they're box checkers as Chamath says. And Iman and I, our backgrounds are basically corporate. Um, so I was part of SVB in the UK. And then I've been in the startup space. I've got operating experience for like less than three years. So combined, we're more corporate guys. And I have like three years operating experience. And I'm saying to Iman and to all these people, I'm like, I'd feel like a fraud right now doing a fund. Um, yes, there are loads of content creators launching funds. But, and this might be me overthinking it. There's this like meme of the midwits, the guy in the middle of the normal distribution, like super frustrated, overthinking it. And you've got the low IQ and the high IQ doing the same thing. They're like, ah, let's just go with it. People is like, and, and it's funny because I'm like, yeah, that, that's me in the middle right there. What, what advice do you have for people like us? And I'm sure there are others as well who like, who are writing sub stacks, who are gaining a bit of traction and market's hot right now. Let's, let's ignore the little dip we've had in the last two weeks in the private public markets. Markets are hot. What do you advise? Do you advise these people, bite the bullet, go ahead? Or would you say to them, double down, get more operating experience, build more of a distribution channel and social proof so that then you won't have to go out and do 1,100 cold calls. Rather, it's more inbound because it compounds over time. Is there? I, I know there's no right or wrong way, but I want to get your view on this. I think my first response would be, I would ask you, what do you want? Do you want to be an investor? Because like, let's talk about this, right? If you start a fund or if you want to be a fund manager, I hope you're prepared for, to make a 20-year commitment. That's exactly right? because, what I said. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I said. Because fund one, 10 years. Yep. Two to three years after that, you'll raise fund two. So another 10 years. Now we're up to 12 to 13. Two to three years after that, you go raise fund three if you've done well for fund one and fund two. So now it's another two to three years. So now we're talking about 16 years. The first three funds, you've only been doing this for maybe four to six years and you've made a commitment for 16, for another 10 now, mm -hmm. right? And that's, and that's just getting started, right? Like, do you want to do that? Like, is this what you want to do? Because once you take people's money, and because like, let's be clear, VCs, we are glorified financial advisors. We take yes. wealthy people's money and help them make more money. And we commit to do that over a 10-year time span per fund, sometimes longer. So I would say, do you want to do that? Is that what you want to do? Then I would say, do you feel like you have deal flow? Do you feel like you have access to unique companies that you think have the potential to return capital? If those two things are true, my last thing would be, why wait? Like, just go do it, right? Like, go out there and get your feet wet. Because, like, outside of working at a venture fund or, you know, doing some hardcore angel investing, there's no other way for you to really get this, to, to start building the skill set stronger. And the hardest part about raising a fund is having a network of individuals who are willing to give you their money to manage. And so if you're telling me you already have access to that, you have people coming to you saying, hey, why don't you raise a fund? I, I got money for you to manage. 
go do it. And yes, it may not be the easiest to raise the fund, but fundraising in general is not easy. Mm -hmm. Unless you've had a unicorn company or unless you're independently wealthy or unless you're a well-known person, fundraising is hard for everybody, point blank. All right. And so like, it's going to be hard today. And if you build up your profile, it's still going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing 1100 meetings, you might have to do 200, but 200 meetings still suck. (laughs) True. So I would say if, if you have access to deal flow and this is what you want to do and you got people who are talking to you about like, hey, I, I, I want to give, commit some money to you if you have a fund, go do it. I'm glad the GOAT has given the, we're on the same page because the two points you raise are the exact two points I've been feeding back to the people who are saying, why don't you do it? And I'm saying it's a 15 year commitment. I, I, I do want to be an investor. Ever since I've been a kid, I was like, investing is like, the main thing I want to do, but the next few years, I don't want to commit to that. I want to continue operating. We'll do a fund in a few years. And by then we have deal flow now it's been improving, but by then we'll have even more deal flow given the compounding effect of the distribution channel and the content game and the social proof. And, and I think in a few years, it'll be a lot easier, but we don't know. But again, I, I totally agree with everything you've said and, uh, yeah, very, very helpful further insights as well. So let's here, say, man. Mac, let's say we do set up the fund. Hold on. Let's play, uh, <laughs> let's, let's play devil's advocate. What mistakes have you seen or you experienced that we could avoid off the bat? Um, never say yes in the first meeting. Don't deploy all your capital in your first three months. <laughs> <laughs> um, be patient. You know, granted, real we haven't been all that patient. We did like 30 investments in 13 months. So like, geez, <laughs> don't, don't necessarily don't take, advice, don't take advice from me. Be clear on your fund model. You know, be clear on your thesis and your model so that, you know, you're setting yourself up to return your fund or outperform, right? Be very clear on that and be very clear on, be, be so clear that as LPs and others push back on it, It doesn't matter. Like, this is what we're doing. Whether you like it or not, this is what we're going to do. And you want to be solid in that. You don't want to be like, well, this is what we're doing. But, you know, you gave a good point. Maybe we should change this. Maybe we should change that. Like, no. Well, you go and be solid in what it is you're going to be about what you're going to do. Um, And watch out for the founders who are really amazing storytellers. Because they will get you hyped. They will get you excited. They will have you jumping for joy. But boy, is it a bunch of vaporware in the background. <laughs> we got that. We got that Persian salesman genetics, man. No one's pulling the wool over our eyes. I say that famous last words, and then we end up doing that. But uh, yeah, got you. Hey, there's a lot of Theranoses out there. Facts. That's what I would say. Yeah, cool. Mac, before we get to the, to the last uh, sort of ending round questions, another sort of question around your background, which is to tie it back to the beginning really is you're a software engineer by trade. You're a hacker and you launch startups as a technical founder. Has this been beneficial or how, how beneficial has this background been in your investing? Um, and they talk about, you know, the benefit, the, the classic, you know, the, the cue, the think boy quotes, but the classic Naval Ravikant, which we always quote, he talks about learn to build, learn to sell. Um, how should technical founders improve at sales and marketing and raising capital? Or do you just recommend they double down, stick to what they know and uh, leave that to the people who do that for a living? So I was a technical engineer. I was never a technical founder. (laughs) Right. So for both of my startups, I was CEO uh, because my first startup, me and my two co-founders were all engineers. So somebody had to do it. And I was the only person that didn't mind talking to people. So that's how I ended up doing that. What I would say, if you're a technical founder, be clear on where it is you want to be. If you want to be about the technology and the product, double down on that. If you want to be the person who makes decisions and wants to be the CEO, learn to do that and learn to sell. Go, go learn to sell, go learn business development, right? Even if that means go take a sales job or BD job somewhere and build that skill set. And that'll serve you really well as a CEO. Take some leadership classes type of thing. But it depends on what you want. Like if you want to have get your hands dirty, if you want to be close to the product, 
if that's what you care about the most, then stay technical, become a CTO, right? If you want to be the decision maker, the strategist, the high level person, the person who's in all the rooms, go be CEO. Because here's the thing, CEOs are like quarterbacks. They get way too much of the credit and way too much of the blame. But they're always the one who's out front. And when you got a founding team, that's always a difficult dynamic. Because the teams, all of y'all are busting your butts, but only one person's getting all the praise. Only one person's getting famous on Twitter. Only one person's getting invited to all the parties, all the conferences, being on stage. That typically is not the CTO. Right? And so you just got to be clear on what, what it is that you want out of this. Balaji, Balaji Srinivasan, the CTO of Coinbase as he was, and then GP and Andreessen, he's a, a sort of exception to that rule, right? Because the guy is just a technical genius, but at the same time, he's developed the skill set to kind of be that CEO, think from the bottom up and top down approach and have this strategic mindset, talk really well, you know, um, and get a book deal out of it ultimately because he's writing a book now. Um, so I guess it works both ways and you can, you can develop yourself and become that type of individual. Elon Musk is another great example, but it's, you know, almost impossible. You, it, you know, you, you, the cream of the crop rise there. Um, so I think you're right in, in, in the answer you gave. Um, Mac, to switch gears and take, take into some more personal type questions. Um, and I suspect you're going to have really, really good answers. So don't let us down. <laughs> Who are your mentors and what valuable direction and advice do they give particularly to you? I have a lot of mentors, a lot of mentors. Um, I'll shout out a few quickly. So first and foremost is my father, right? Like he, one of the biggest influences, and he is probably the biggest influence on my life, right? He's the one who was always, my dad was a dreamer. So he was the one who was always pushing me to think about what it meant to be an owner, not an employee, right? Um, Vince Talbert, um, one of the founders of Bill Me Later, a, a, a Maryland company that sold to PayPal for over a billion, for close to a billion dollars years ago. Um, he was the first big time tech executive I ever met. And, you know, he's somebody who's developed into a friend and somebody I can call anytime about anything. Uh, Marlon Nichols of Mac Ventures, love the name of his fun. Um, no relation, somebody, right? No relation? You know, no relation, <laughs> but, you know, Marlon's been somebody I've looked up to and respected since, you know, he broke into venture. You know, I'm, I'm lucky to have gotten to know him. And he's another person whenever I need it, I can, I can text and call. Um, Charles Hudson, the precursor, you know, when I was working for the state of Maryland, you know, we started a pre-seed fund for underrepresented founders. Charles was like the person who kind of like coined that phrase pre-seed, like Charles is the one. Um, he is now somebody I can, I can call on and, you know, be a calming voice. Um, and then Jeff, the CEO of, of Kaufman more recently is somebody who's become a dear friend and coffin on of mine. And then on top of that, my Kaufman class, you know, I'm part of class 26, but the Kaufman family in general, like all of Kaufman, anybody who's ever been through Kaufman, like they are my family, they are my mentors, they are my advisors, they are my LPs, they are my everything. So that's just to call out a few people. And there's, there's tons of more. Um, I hate giving out names because then, you know, you always end up missing some folks inevitably. But um, those are some of the individuals who have been really impactful for me and who are always pushing me in the right direction, challenging me to think bigger and letting me know that what may seem crazy and overwhelming in the moment, it's just a moment. Things will get better. Just dig the course, you know, trust the process and they'll get there. Awesome. And the final thing we really like to wrap up with Mac, which I guess we ask everyone is, what are some of your personal or favorite values or principles that you personally live by and that have helped you in work and generally in life? Nobody gets here alone. Nobody does any of this by themselves. Everybody's helped help along the way. And so because of that, it is incumbent on all of us to give back, right? 
I wouldn't be here if not for the folks I just mentioned and a host of other folks along the way who were there to support me when I was down and out, when I didn't have money, when I was in trouble, when I was messing up, when I was, you know, screwing up, when I was, you know, led astray. And so I make sure I, um, I'm always giving back to others um, and not looking for anything in return. Because again, like I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for people helping me. And so it was incumbent to me to help others. Beautiful. What a way to end. Mac, it's been an absolute pleasure. We will not only hit you up when we're in the States, but more importantly, in a few years when, when we do launch this fund, by then you'll be a big shot GP. You would have surpassed Sequoia. And uh, we're going to reach out to the Kingpin of Venture. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Let's do this. Let's do this. Hopefully I can be an LP in your first fund. Let's see. And hopefully we can come out and uh, ride some dirt bikes. But I, it's, not very, <laughs> it's not very on brand, but i got to wear some knee pads and helmets, you know? That's all good. We'll, we'll show you how to do it in Baltimore. <laughs> Hmm. Mac, thanks so much, man. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you, fellas. Y'all have a good one.